um, I want to say thank you so much again for coming. This is the launch of our new series of book programs called Janum Book Club. Um, and they are, this is a series of programs highlighting important um, literary works within the Japanese American community. Um, so this is of course such a perfect way to kick this off um, and to tell this important story. Um, this is also a collaboration with our, new, with our National Center for the Preservation of Democracy, which is where you are right now in the physical space. And we also hired a new director, Jim Herr, who is over here, um, who's our new director of the National Center for the Preservation of Democracy. Um, so please keep an eye out on exciting things to come with the NCPD. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass the mic over to a few more welcomes from um, Janum and to our board chair, uh, Bill Fujioka, who will be giving a few welcoming remarks. Uh, excuse me, I'm cold. Well, welcome. I'm here to welcome you to the Japanese American National Museum as as stated, I'm the board chair, but um, more importantly, a retired public servant. I, um, I'm, I'm, well, before I say anything, Warren's standing over here. You know, Warren, the definition of friendship and respect and admiration is someone coming out in a freezing day like this. <laughs> but that's, that's because of who he is and what he is, and more importantly, what he represents. Now, I've known Warren for a long time. I think both of us had black hair when we met. And as you get older, <laughs> and me going up the stairs, I have to hold the railing, but it's all good. But I, he's someone, it's, it, it's important, I think this book is important. But all of us, because we know Warren, we've been part of his life, we've watched his life as he went from a community activist to the point where a day in city council when he was arrested for creating this amazing disturbance, but then becoming, going into politics, because he recognized that community activism addresses one part, but change is when you're part and you're able to influence decisions made not only locally, but in Sacramento. And for those of you, a lot of you know what he's done, but there's a couple of highlights that I want to mention. You know, he worked to establish and increase AAPI admissions through, and program university and college programs throughout the nation. He helped establish ethnic studies. He was the leading force to, to, for UCLA and Long Beach State to adopt Asian studies. But when I first talk about establishing admissions, do you understand the impact he did? What, what I believe in, in our respective lives. We all have different job titles. We have different experiences. We have different, we contribute to society in different ways. But it's all said and done. It's about making an impact, right folks? And this man, the impact he's made to not only the AAPI community, but the overall community at large. The, his strength, but not just strength as an individual, but how he brought the community together to stand up and speak when it was very, very difficult for people to stand up and speak because the older generations were saying, what are you doing? But yet Warren said, I'm doing as much as I can. And I have tremendous respect for this man. You know, he, um, one of his assembly bills, AB 37, it resulted in Japanese Americans who denied high school um, diplomas in getting their diplomas. He authored AB 1775 to honor Fred Korematsu. And we all know that Korematsu was, is a legend in our community. But the, in the bill it said that he wanted to emphasize the constitutional rights afforded to all Americans, regardless of race and ancestry, particularly the right to due process and life, liberty, and property to oppose civil liberties. Here at Janum, our job is to preserve the stories, preserve what happened to the J-8 community during World War II. But for, for all of us, what's even more important, to retell the story, to ensure that social injustice doesn't happen to any other community again. And so today, I salute my, my friend, Warren. And next, I'm gonna ask to introduce Jason. And Jason is, um, I don't know if you're going to 
do a little performance or something. Yeah. With all respect, I'm a Motown boy. <laughs> I can do that. I can, I'm 70 years old. I can do, still do the, Mo, the Temptation Shuffle. So <laughs> with all due respect, but I love your message. The message for me is what you're all about, what's important. So please, Jason. And then Warren, my friend Warren. Warren. All right, thank you so much. What's up, folks? My name is uh, Jason Chu. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a rapper. Uh, I try to take after the OGs and be an activist. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll share some more words. But for now, let's do a little music. Is that OK? Yeah. All right. Y'all probably know this, but kintsugi is the art of taking something that was broken, mending it with gold till it was more beautiful than it was when it was whole, before it was broken. And ain't that just a great metaphor for us? Kintsugi had to go broke to get my gold medal. I'm not special, God just outworks the devil. Test metal, the bezel is still. I'm still standing, air cushion my hill. I'm still rapping, afternoon cat napping, multiple plane landings. Then I go out to tell tales. I talk story, got bops for top 40. That glory still not mine, but I'm chill. I'm built by the blood and will that got spilled. My sis sit in Yuji Ichioka office, that's real. What move needles don't raise pulse. We came on boats so my people don't wave hot. Mm. Strange plots, I believe about half of them. I know what I love, I don't need a freaking algorithm. I'm still standing and all of my mans in them. Fruit from the trees, don't forget the ones who planted them. Together, and we are generations incarcerated. Kelly Lytle Hernandez taught me about our situation. Black bodies, Latinos, Asians, and natives swapped in and out the system like replacements. Red eye flights, I'm just working the late shift. Flying over cities, but it's not for no vacation. Visiting a college, but not for matriculation. If it ain't for liberation, I don't consider that an education. Job creation, our whole lives are background check. Work hard, but you still can't buy respect. Dr. Wen Ho Lee, now I'm in solitary, then release the government apology won't iron out the crease. White author said to learn some patience. Hard when I see our elders turning into patience. Green cards go yards, Asians crazy rich. Fast cars, peace marches, a crazy mix. I didn't grow up in LA, I grew up on the East Coast. I grew up not, I grew up hearing, right? Hearing but not knowing that I was Asian American. Uh, and what I mean by that is I was told, right? I, it was described to me. You know, I, I, I'm Asian and I'm American, so I must be Asian American. But I didn't know what Asian American meant. That's why I moved to LA. I moved to LA because I knew if I wanted to do this music, hip hop, I grew up in hip hop. If, if you grew up in Motown, I grew up uh, with Def Jam. <laughs> and, uh, and what hip hop taught me was you gotta know your roots, right? You gotta know where you come from. Cause if you know where you come from and you know whose you are, then you know where you're going. So I moved to LA so that I could find the ones that had come before me. You know what I'm saying? I knew that I couldn't be the first. I knew that in my heart, this desire for Asian American soul, this desire to know why this body I was given and this community and, and, and the family I was given is and moves through this world the way we do. How to stand up, right? How to speak out. I knew we couldn't be the first ones to want to do this. So I moved to LA looking for this. 
looking for the people, looking for the, not the ideas, the experiences that built spaces like this. Um, got a couple more words, but I got more music too. That still work for y'all? Yeah. Okay, yeah, make some noise. If y'all are here for Warren Furutani. Yeah. Warren T. Furutani. This one's called imposter syndrome. This is how I've learned to walk through life. Walk around the city with a chip up on my shoulder. Standing red carpet pictures, but I've never been a poser. Focused on my goals, my circle is getting closer. Way beyond the days we do a favor for exposure. Stereotypes, little slights, they try to slide through. My big sister earned that PhD, forget you. No talking down on us, the sun, it won't go down on us. Father crossed an ocean so your waves, they won't be drowning us. Crowning us royalty, I'm talking we to the widest degree. My team is large enough, we could start our own league. Satchel Page, Japanese kids playing basketball at younger age. A pilgrimage to Yuri Kochi, I'm a grave. We belong here, no need for toleration. My ancestors laid the tracks that unified this nation. Libations and vibe your orations. And it never came easy, but the goal is worth the waiting. Walk around the city with a chip up on my shoulder. Standing for coffee pictures, but I've never been a poser. Focused on my goals, my circle is getting closer. Way beyond the days we do a favor for exposure. Walk around the city with a chip up on my shoulder. Standing red carpet pictures, but I've never been a poser. Focused on my goals, my circle is getting closer. Way beyond the days we do a favor for exposure. Yeah. Imposter syndrome, making a living still it claimed a victim. Since schoolboy accustomed to habits and contradictions. Predictions were always Yale and never jail though. Still I seen both. Mm. The pressure's on like the barometer broke. That I would never measure up. Then I look down on most. What a joke. I'm balancing bruised egos and arrogance. Full of pride while I hide my embarrassment. The shoes I feel could break this box, they try to set us in. I didn't study it, but still we make this medicine. You bet on me, better believe, yeah, I bet I win. I'm better than the benefits of doubt they try to play me with. Walk around the city with a chip up on my shoulder. Standing red carpet pictures, but I've never been a poser. Focused on my goals, my circle is getting closer. Way beyond the days we do a favor for exposure. Walk around the city with a chip up on my shoulder. Standing red carpet pictures, but I've never been a poser. Focused on my goals, my circle is getting closer. Way beyond the days we do a favor for exposure, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So uh, it's such a huge honor uh, to be here with the, uh, with the family and the friends and, and the man himself of Warren Prutani. Um, like I said, I, uh, I grew up and, and I heard about being Asian American and I came to LA to be Asian American, to embrace, uh, and, and, and Lord willing, and you know, sometimes I feel like it's happening and sometimes I don't know, but to be embraced by a community, right? That's, what, that's where so much of this, you know, we talk about building power, we talk about standing up, we talk about uh, solidarity, uh, community organizing. So much of it is just being around people that love you and, and that you feel like you can love. Um, and this is, I, I'm, I'm just gonna say that so much of the music I make and the words I write and the ideas that I have come from the legacy that, that Warren embodies and has pushed forward. And I wanna also especially say, before I get out of here, because there's much, much other more musical acts and, and readings to come. I wanna say that uh, what Warren has to say and, and what he's lived and the experiences um, that he has and so many of our friends here have, have never been more relevant. Um, who in here has heard of TikTok? Either it just sounds funny or, or you're laughing because you've heard it. Um, what's wild is right now, you go on TikTok, you go on YouTube, you go on Instagram, and 
people, young folks, are going nuts about discovering the history that's embodied in this room because so many folks are growing up questioning and saying, why have I not, you know, I know it's out there. Where can I find it? And it's in books like this, and it's in spaces like these and communities like these that that gets answered. So, you know, this, this we're, we're talking about a legacy, but a legacy means it's going somewhere. And I would say that right now in this present moment, the words and the stories that Warren has are vital and urgent and will, I believe, have an impact um, in decades and generations to come. That's my time. Thank you all so much. Put your hands together for everything else that's about to come. All right, let's give uh, another hand to MC Jason Chu. very reflective, very insightful, and uh, from a, a DJ and b-boy for life, hey, hey, hey. thank you, brother. <laughs> Let's give another round of applause. <laughs> so good afternoon, brothers and sisters. My name is Mark Polito. Yeah. <laughs> <It's out there. laughs> <All right. laughs> and I will serve as your moderator today for the book launch of the Honorable Warren Furtani's Memoir Activists. Uh, let me intentionally repeat that with the full title of Warren's book, Activists. Noun, a person who works to bring about political or social change. And let me emphasize that that's activists with a lowercase a. I'm very honored and deeply humbled to be a part of this historic community event. Uh, Warren and I are longtime friends. Our families are friends. Missy jokes. <laughs> and we are former co workers and longtime colleagues. Uh, most importantly, though, Warren has been my mentor, my role model, my guru, my confidant, my defender at times, and my all around Jedi master. <laughs> True. Uh, like Warren, I'm a lifelong activist, organizer, and elected official. I came up in the generation that followed Warren's in the 1980s as a student activist, community organizer, turned political legislative staffer, school board member, city council member, and mayor of my hometown, Cerritos, which is just 15 miles east on the 91 freeway from Warren and the Furutanis in Gardena. I'm a proud son of immigrants from the Philippines, a son of the movement and the struggle, and a child of the 60s and 70s. I was raised on Soul Train and Star Wars, and then hip hop in the early 80s. And then I met Warren. I met Warren my freshman year at UCLA, first at a Samahang Filipino meeting in Ackerman Union 2408. I remember it vividly. Introduced by my brother, Tony Ricasa, and then again, I met Warren at a rally, <clears throat> of all places, on the steps of Campbell Hall, protesting racism in higher education, advocating for diversity and a relevant education, and for the tenure of Dr. Don Nakanishi. Mm -hmm. Fast forward 13 years, we became co-workers at the Assembly Speaker's office. We were colleagues, lunch buddies, and fast friends. On our many coffee breaks, Actually, Warren would drink coffee, and I would always eat a cup of pudding from the cafeteria. <laughs> we would talk about the community, the movement, and basically we would just connect and vibe on a whole nother level. Often I would say to Warren that he really needed to write a book. But not just a book, a book for the people, for the community and especially for the next generations coming up in the movement, coming up in the struggle. Now I know there were likely many, probably many in this room, who probably told Warren the same thing. <clears throat> well, years later, 
I'm so overjoyed that we are all here today. Warren asked that I explain that he asked me to moderate this book, read this book reading and discussion to serve as a prodder and an interviewer along the way. <clears throat> he also wanted me to state the disclaimer that this book, this memoir, is not meant to be an academic thesis, nor the end all be all about the movement. In fact, Warren texted me just last night and he said, let's just have fun. Let's just have fun with this and just have a conversation among friends. So with that, just like old times, but this time without the coffee and chocolate pudding, let's get started. Okay. Let's start by <clears throat> setting the foundation for Warren's political and personal point of view, his perspective. And at this time, I'm so honored to introduce one of the youngest of the Furutani family. She's eight years young, in the third grade, is a hip hop dancer and a ukulele player. And I just learned this term. She's a gosei, rokusei, fifth, sixth generation Japanese American. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Warren's granddaughter, Harley Furutani. My grandpa was born October 16, 1947, to Mary and Charles Furutani. His father and mother were native-born Californians, and like his dad, he was born in San Pedro, California. San Pedro is the southernmost part of the city of Los Angeles and the home of the Port of L.A. Actually, his birth is the result of good news and bad news. The bad news is his parents suffered from being wrongfully incarcerated in, Amer in America's concentration camps because they were Japanese-American during World War II. The good news is, if that didn't happen, a farm girl from Elk Grove, California, never would have met a city slicker from Los Angeles, San Pedro. In other words, he never would have been born. When he was a boy, my grandpa was called Tabo. His mom said they called him Tabo because when little, his older brother couldn't sing to Dashi. Everyone in Grandpa's immediate and extended family called him Tabo. His friends on the block called him Tabo, and his dad called him T-Bones, which is a nickname of a nickname. His older cousin taught him how to spell to Dashi. The Dashi is his Japanese middle name, but his real name is Warren. I was sitting on the grass in South Park near Watts. I was one of the few non-blacks in the gathering to hear black power advocate So Carmichael speak. My friend Julie Jefferson dragged me there with the promise that I'd dig what this brother had to say. I was Julie's brother and oftentimes her partner in crime. We were born on the same day in the same year, but we met at Perry Junior High School and Mrs. Aguirre's Spanish class. We were both sitting in the back of the classroom where we were scrubs, seventh graders just starting junior high school in 1959. Julie was bused to Perry from an enclave of single family homes in the unincorporated part of LA County near the city of Gardena. Perry's in Gardena. The homes in her area were well kept, nice, but humble and for the most part owned by primarily African Americans. Julie and Jocelyn, Julie's older sister, were smart and always wore dresses to school. They were constantly admonished and expected to be proper young ladies and unequivocally lived up to that code. But as much as her mother, Edna Louise, controlled all that took place in the home, she could not completely control what was happening outside in the community or in the society at large. Julie Jefferson and I, friends to the end, came of age in the 60s. In the 50s and 60s, you could walk to school. As restrictive as things might have been during those times, and maybe because it was so, there was more openness, but within accepted limits. But that was the underlying issue, limits. I saw and felt those limits in the 50s and 60s. For example, as seniors in high school, Julie and I were voted the female and male students with the best personalities. I guess that meant we had a good way about ourselves, 
but personality-wise, we couldn't have been more different. Julie was outgoing in the life of the party. I was introverted, quiet, and unassuming. We both neatly fit into our profile and stayed in our lane, but it wasn't like our friends and peers imposed those limits on us. Our interactions were based on tried and true defense survival mechanisms. We knew how we should act, and we knew our place in society. After Julie and I graduated, summer of 65, she went to Knoxville College in Tennessee. It was her family's tradition to go to the historical black college in HBCU for the next level of education, an education as it was, but different and not traditional in the traditional sense. Julie left Cardina High School with the best personality, being the life of the party, and with a Mary Tyler Moore hairdo, <laughs> split in the middle, parted in the middle, gone down to the sides and then flipped up at the ends. She once tried to explain to me how she did that with her hair, but I never quite understood. But I did learn you never touch a black woman's hair. <laughs> by 1965, the Civil Rights and Voter Rights Acts had been passed by Congress, but Knoxville was still in the South, so Julie, with her Southern California sensibilities, ran headlong into the segregated South. She left as the life of the party, but on her return, she wanted to join the party, the Black Panther Party, that is. So Julie's Mary Tyler Moore hairdo, her demure dresses were replaced by a monstrous afro and an African daishiki. Of the many things Stokely said that day, one comment struck me and stayed with me ever since. Stokely said the most important thing for black people to do is to define themselves for themselves and by themselves. Now, no matter how much I identified with black culture, no matter how well I could dance, and I could do the Temptation Shuffle and walk as well, <laughs> I knew I wasn't black. So what Stokely said to the crowd did not include me. I was not black, but what was I? Mark. Would you use that one of those microphones? Are you gonna sit here or are you gonna be there? No, I'm here. Okay, you got it. All right, Warren, tell us a little bit about what this 12 units thing is. Well, just looking around the room, I can see that not only did good friends come out and brave the weather to get here today, but I can see by our age that a lot of you remember that 12 units was the threshold of the number of units you had to carry in college to stay out of the draft. Well, that 12 units was something that we all tried to keep except as my friends went off to colleges and universities, I went to the community college and was pretty much lost trying to find my way. And probably because of too much guitar playing, a little bit too much of going to the beach, and a little too much of this, <laughs> I lost my 12 units and got drafted. And when I got drafted, it was one of those things where I finally got the point where you were gonna go into the army. And I went the day before to do two of my favorite things. I played tennis, but while playing tennis, I slipped and fell and got a strawberry on my leg. Nothing serious, but a good rash of a strawberry. Then my next most favorite thing, I went body surfing at the beach. So I kept going into the water and coming out of the water, laying in the sand, and the sand would get into the scab on my leg, and I did it over and over and over. So the next day, my brother took me down to the induction center. I had this little bag that told you, just bring a little bag with your most essential things you need to have. But the last thing that the doctors do is they get all the new recruits in the circle, they ask you to drop your pants, and they take one last look at all the new recruits. When he came to me, he stopped, and he took his pointer, and he tapped the scab. He said, uh, well, where did you get that? And I explained it, and he said, we're not going to take you this month, we'll take you next month. And in my head I screamed, wait a minute, they goddamn already have the party for me. 
my uncle, who in the most conversation I ever had for me, grunted, but he wanted to celebrate that I was going to be the next generation of Japanese Americans to follow in the footstep of my uncle in the 442. So when I went home, of course my brother asked me what the hell I'm doing here. I decided that the governor had called and given me a reprieve. I loaded up my 1957 Volkswagen and I went north. Warren, what do the initials CSM and CRP stand for? Be all for all this draft stuff happened, I visited a friend who went to UC Santa Barbara. As it turned out, he participated in a summer program at the College of San Mateo, and that's where I met him. That program was called the College Readiness Program. It was run by a brother named Bob Hoover and a sister named Jean Worth. The College Readiness Program, CRP, was a predecessor to the EOP programs. The CRP, like the EOP did later, enrolled non-traditional students in college programs, and in the case of the CRP, it was at a community college. I don't know how Bob and Jean got a foothold on campus and started this innovative college program where students from East Palo Alto, mostly black, from the Mission District in San Francisco, mostly Latino, San Francisco Chinatown, of course, had Chinese students, and also working class white students from the area and Native Americans from several of the reservations on the peninsula. They were recruited to the CRP. This was the vision of Bob Hoover and for Gene Worth. Gene was motivated by wanting to do good, which we all appreciate. She followed the old adage of give a person a fish and he'll eat that day. Bob's motivation was to empower those students of color by giving them tools, knowledge, and the wisdom to make it and to change society. He believed if you teach a person how to fish, they can eat and have food for the rest of their life. Whenever there was a program or opportunity to speak to the public about the CRP program, Bob would make sure that there was always a diversity of speakers who would share their background and paths to CRP. Since there weren't many Asian Americans, my turn, damn it, kept coming up more frequently and more frequently. This forced me to figure out something to say. I was challenged to define them myself and share it in the public eye. But on campus, the cafeteria had a weekly oriental food extravaganza. Of course, the Asian students all laughed at the Uncle Ben's rice and the horrible attempts at making Chinese food. So when I was asked to speak at some event, I started to make fun about the weekly oriental food bazaar. This is what I thought about the crap they passed off as chow mein in the cafeteria. This was my perspective, my point of view. In my first semester being at the College of San Mateo, the program funding for the CRP was cut before the winter break. Our response in the program was to demonstrate in the hopes of restoring the funding. CRP students, friends, and supporters marched and demonstrated on campus. Rallies were held, and as was a procedure, every group was represented and spoke. My turn, as usual, kept coming up, and also my sense of outrage grew as well. Then, as we rallied on December 13, 1968, the football team got into its mind that they were going to physically take control of the situation and restore order. Violence, though, was not a foreign concept to CRP students. The CRP posse, posse kicked the football team's butt, but it also sparked a full-blown riot. Fights, breaking of windows, fires were started in trash cans, and of course the riot police were called. As we were being pushed off campus by the scrimmage of line of riot police, I remember my friend Rod Murray was crying, not in fear of pain, but in frustration. He lamented how the issue would now change from the righteous call to save the ERP, CRP, to a reaction to the violence. It was very prophetic in his observation because there was an immediate, unmitigated reaction to the riot. Being one of the speakers on Friday the 13th, I was along with the other speakers charged with inciting to riot. While dealing with my legal dilemma, I, of course, thought I should call home. 
of my dad beat me to the punch. That evening on the 13th, my dad called and asked how I was. I said, I'm doing fine. He said, no, you're not. I just saw you on television running across the campus <laughs> in some kind of riot. <laughs> but San Mateo County was known to be a super conservative area. Consequently, my lawyer advised me to forego a jury trial and to let the judge make the final determination. There was no shortage of witnesses to testify against me. The witnesses that supposedly saw me lead the violence, or saw me start the fires, or throw the rocks that broke the windows. They had me all over at the campus, but all at the same time. Once it was established that I spoke at the rally, but I didn't incite people to riot, the negative testimony took care of itself. And also, the age-old stereotype that we all look alike saved my ass that day in court. <laughs> By virtue of being one of the first Asians who jailed and were incited to riot, I got some notoriety. Nobody knew my name, nobody knew who I was, but they heard that an Asian got arrested at the College of San Mateo for inciting to riot. <laughs> when the San Francisco State and UC Berkeley students' demonstrations jumped off, many more Asians swelled the list of arrestees. As Asian American Pacific Islander student activists, as we manned the barricades and occupied the administration buildings, our movement started to coalesce. Whatever, wherever there were Asian American students on campus, or an Asian American community, there was a potential than the actual development of the movement. It's as if we all came to the same threshold in history and we stepped over all at the same time in unison. And we took our place alongside, not behind, not as allies, but as sisters and brothers in the black, brown, red, and white communities as we all fought for social justice. Well, why don't we uh, shift gears and explore your personal life a little bit? You know, and a, a lot of you in the audience know that uh, my brothers and I had the cool dad. He was different than many of my friends' fathers because he would talk to you. He would give the local kids rides on his motorcycle. He would spend time with you. And by the time he was 21, he had two sons, and eventually he would have a total of four. So my brothers and I, we sort of grew up with my dad and his interest. Hiroshi Charles Furutani, or Chuck, was a third generation Japanese American who grew up in, as a boy in a Tom Sawyer-like atmosphere, at least as he tells it. He was born in San Pedro, California, but grew up on an island in the middle of the port of Los Angeles. Terminal Island was a community that was a part of the multi-ethnic port town and the base for the tuna sardine industry from before the turn of the century, the 20th century, that is. Chuck's father, my grandfather, Kantaro Charlie Furutani, had a gas station, and my dad's mom, Kikoe Higashi, was a Japanese school teacher and worked at the immigration office, and she was an outspoken leader among the women in the community. Since my grandfather had one of the few gas stations in Terminal Island, he knew almost everybody. And because he and my grandmother were second generation Japanese American, born in Hawaii, they were bilingual, a major advantage in an immigrant community. While my grandmother used her station in the community to help others, my grandfather used his to be a bit of a rogue. My father recounts the many times he was sent off by his mother to find his father going in and out of the many bars and places of ill repute that Grandpa might frequent proved to be usually an unsuccessful undertaking. But my dad recounts his time in Terminal Island in a Tom Sawyer, Huck Finnish kind of way, sneaking in and out of the alleyways he avoided the yogures, the bad boys, who wanted to visit a beating onto the son of the Japanese school teacher who mercilessly punished them when they talked in class or didn't do their homework. But this cat and mouse game was nothing but a cops and rogers, cowboy and Indians, or Jack Armstrong, the American, all-American boy scenario. That was until December 7th, 1941. No Jack Armstrong here, just a slanty-eyed Jap 
who when waiting to get off the ferry to go to school, he was told in no uncertain terms to go back to Terminal Island and Japan. No Japs were wanted here. My dad was a Jap. No matter that he lived, went to school and what he learned about the Constitution, no matter that he didn't even speak Japanese and liked a hamburger as much as he did an onigiri or rice ball, no matter that he knew the Boy Scout Three Finger Salute, President Roosevelt and the American government was giving him, a native-born American, the One Finger Salute. Chuck was no longer the heir apparent of Jack Armstrong. He became Hiroshi, a son of the rising sun. What did that mean for Terminal Island, specifically Fish Harbor? It meant that all Japanese had to get off the island with whatever they could carry in 48 hours. My mother was cursed. She was born the youngest of the four and had four older brothers in a Japanese immigrant household. That means that you and your mother are basically pretty much subservient to the needs of the men in the home. Then when she got married to my father, she ended up having four sons who she slaved over. Mary Matsuo Yamada was born in Sheldon, California, a whistle-stop farming town just south of Sacramento. But she grew up in Elk Grove and lived the life of a farm girl with Japanese immigrant parents and four older brothers. She and her mom were the support system for the men in the family and the other Japanese farmers. But once their chores were accomplished and completed, once they cleaned everything up, they took their turn crouching down to handpick the berries or climb the ladders to handpick the fruit. My mom and my dad in camp, after a whirlwind courtship, plans and promises were made. She was sh he was shipping out to Europe soon, and he was embarking from the city of New York. The plan was that if when or if he came back as a replacement for the 442 from the war, they would meet up in New York. As it turns out, it became a policy that if you had a job waiting for you in the East, you could leave camp early. My mom got a promise of work from a domestic agency in New York City. She and several other Japanese American women went East. There, her initial job was waiting for her, but it didn't last long. The Caucasian man who sought her help with domestic chores wanted more from her employment. Remember, my mom had grown up with four brothers, so handling the unwanted advances of her employer resulted in my mother seeking another job and a broken nose for her first employer. <laughs> On the troop ship across the Atlantic, my father tells me that Hitler heard that battling Chuck Furutani was on his way, <laughs> so he decided to surrender and give up. <laughs> so the war ended as the boat was going across the Atlantic. Once it reached Europe, it turned around and he came back in style because they commissioned the Queen Mary to bring them back. And as the plan goes, my mother was waiting. Uh, you, spirit. you got it. Folks, talking about Warren's family, uh, honored to introduce two members of his family at this time for performance. Let's give it up for Marcia and Alan for a time. say that uh, um, I've known Warren for 71 years <laughs> and I want to say it ain't no big deal <laughs> I want to say one more thing when you read the book I ain't no crybaby <laughs>
Alan wrote the song in the late 70s, I believe. So, um, gosh, so something about how it feels about family, community. Spirits talking. Spirits walking. 
grandparents. <coughs> My grandparents never owned the patch of land where they grew strawberries. And they lived in a rented house on the corner of Elk Grove Road and Bradshaw Boulevard. They and many other Japanese lived in the immediate area and farmed parcels of land. On the same plot of land lived the Yamanakas. Across the road lived the Sugimoros. Down the road lived the Iwatsudus and many, many more. But one of the things I will always associate with my mother is swimming. Every summer in Elk Grove, mom would take us to our secret swimming hole on the Kasumas River. That's where I saw my mom swim for the first time. As we peered into the running water and looked across at the Rocky Wall Canyon, my mom dove in and swam to the other side. She wasn't wearing any fancy swimming suit, but with mouths agape, my brothers and I marveled at the ease in which she swam. And to us, she was every bit of Esther Williams. Some of you just asked your neighbor what the word Esther Williams is. Although for years these adventures were relegated to the summertime, one year things changed. Mom got sick with TV and had to go stay in the sanatorium for a whole year. She went back to Elk Grove to live with Obachan and Jichan. We went back to Elk Grove to live with Obachan and Jichan for that year when my father worked in Los Angeles. That year in Elk Grove, Norm was nine years old, I was eight, and Alan, my youngest brother, was only four. I have another brother, Stoney, who came along much later. Norm and I went to school, and Alan stayed home with Obachan as she went about her duties in the fields. Being so young, I think Alan felt and took the brunt of the blow, the psychological blow of not having a mother for that year. As much as Obacha tried, and Alan would always be her favorite, she couldn't fill the void my mother left because Alan was so young. Plus, since he was much younger, he couldn't be involved with what Norm and I were doing. Alan to this day has never forgiven Obachan or us for leaving him behind when the Yamanakas took us to the state fair. Obachan enticed Alan to go with her to pick his favorite fruit pears to distract him as we went off to the fair. Once he learned he was duped and he didn't cry, he never has forgiven us. Another example of trying to bridge the age gap as it related to activities was the first time Alan ever went to a movie. Since leaving him behind caused such a breach of trust, when we went to the fair, the Yamanakas decided to take Alan with us when we went to the movie. The problem was that Alan's first movie was The Creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> Alan's never been quite the same ever since. <laughs> that year was a long one for all involved. I remember waving from behind the chain link fence to my mother, who was framed by the hospital barracks window. Much later, Dad confided in me that he regretted shipping out to stay. He regretted shipping us out to stay with a watch out. He said he should have kept us at home and gutted it out. Maybe he just watched an episode of My Three Sons. But we all survived, we thrived. And we had an extended family support system. And my brothers and I will forever be indebted to Frank, Joe, and Sumi Yamanaka and the rest of the family. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give it up for Alan Furutani on saxophone and flute, and a Marcia on guitar, and Brother Joe Verrado, right there he is, on bass. All right.
Warren, I, I know after uh, College of San Mateo, you, you were uh, at San Jose State for a little bit. Um, but then after that, you came back home to LA. Why don't you tell us about that? In Los Angeles, the Asian American movement was well and thriving. There were efforts at the local, local campuses to open up admissions and to start ethnic studies programs. But there was also a demand for relevant education on all campuses in the area. In the Asian American community, Serve the People programs were starting to flourish and grow in response to long ignored societal problems and issues. Other endeavors related to journalism, filmmaking like visual communications, Amerasia Bookstore, music and performing arts all sprang to life and were imbued by the politics of the moment. Just to touch on a few, but when I came back to Los Angeles, I got a job because my father wanted me to get out of the house at a place called Japanese Village in Deer Park in Buena <laughs> Park. They were looking and my dad was going there for lunch one day and he heard that they were looking for a Japanese American to MC and to announce their bear show. Well, my dad leaned over and said, do I have a person for you? <laughs> so although comfortable, relatively speaking in public, I became the announcer for the bear show and the dolphin show. And the opening line was like, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the world's only two million gallon artificially salted inland waterway. But in working at Japanese Village in Deer Park, it began to fall apart and realized that how fake it really was, like so many theme parks are and have been. I then wrote an article for Gijo, one of the first Gijo newspapers. Now, Gijo was started by students at UCLA that came off campus and started a counterculture newspaper. And it communicated what the movement was about and it also talked about all these different things that were happening in the community. But it was tongue in cheek because they took the title Ghidra, which was one of those atomic energy monsters in the Godzilla genre. Yeah. So Ghidra was in Los Angeles, and then in San Francisco they had a newspaper called Rodan. <laughs> so I don't know how it got started on all that, but I had a column in the newspaper. But also coming back to LA, I met a guy named Mo, Mo Nishida, and some of you know Mo. Mo's an OG, he's an original gangster. He, along with Mia Iwataki and many others, used to sit in the back room in a place, as I remember, called the Alibi Club, I think called Crenshaw. And they talked about how we needed an Asian American movement because the African American community, the Latino Chicano community, people were all starting to move. So Mo was a catalyst for that. But one time on one of my trips to LA to speak at a meeting, I met a fledgling group called the Yellow Brotherhood. They were a cast of real down-home characters with a swaggering edge that us campus activists didn't have. While talking to them, I kept thinking they would want to take my lunch money. <laughs> As it turned out, their street corner bravado and their on-the-run emulation of the Black Panther Party was the front for caring about the unaddressed plague of drug overdoses happening in the community. The Elder Yellow Brotherhood put this problem of drugs in the face of the community. For years, the community hid the problem of drug deaths and overdoses with quiet resignation and shame. But the YB wouldn't be let it be hidden any longer. But those kind of things also kicked off other organizations like Go For Broke. They were dealing with this drug problem, the use of primarily reds in the Asian American community. That was in the east side. In the J Flats area, we had a group called Love. I don't know what the acronym stands for, but it was Love. Then in the Bay Area, we had the South Bay Asian involvement. Then we had the Asian Sisters, which grew then collectively to Asian American Drug Abuse Program which spawned the joint communications where we work with Asian Americans in prison. Then we also had as an offspring the Korean Youth Community Council, the Involved Together Asian Group on, on the West Side, Search to Involve Filipinos, the Council of Oriental Organizations, ABCON, the Asian American Pacific Equity, the Legal Center, 
Asian Americans for Advancing Justice, the movement started spawning organizations throughout the Asian Pacific Islander American community. And most of the organizations that we see today that are providing human social services to the community, they owe their beginnings to the Asian American movement. But there was one group in particular that was really interesting, it was called JACS, the Japanese American Community Services Asian Involvement Office. The JACS AI staff was made up of key players from the Asian American movement. The AI office was pretty much the headquarters for the community aspect of this new Asian American movement. You couldn't cast a more unique group of characters to staff the AI office. The two formal hires, Mia Iwataki and Ray Tasaki, staffed the office, but they shared their salary with the other organizers who worked there. They used a co-op style of staffing, and the goal wasn't a paid job. It was merely a survival method to facilitate their movement organizing efforts. This style of living brought more organizers into the fold and maximized how many could survive on Mia and Ray's paycheck. Both Mia, a fierce woman warrior for social justice, and Mo, the OG, undoubtedly started the Asian American movement in LA with other friends and comrades. But in the movement, the Jack's office was one of the first bases of operation. It was a love child of the once robust take care of your own community services legacy within the community that had faded after the war and the civil rights movement. Although many good folks and organizers passed through the Jack's office, there are three other players that were mainstays and key to the building of the movement at that time. Ray Tasaki, a colorful ex-con and reformed drug user, was hired along with Mia as the original staff. Ray was rock and roll added to Mia's Martha and the Vandellas approach to organizing. He had unruly hair that he kept corralled with Jimmy Hendrix that bandana. Another was Richard Taguchi. Togo was a do-everything kind of guy. He was good with people and could engage with anyone, high or low, on the socioeconomic step ladder of any ethnicity or race, of any age or gender. He was people power personified. Then there was Russell Valparaiso. Russell also helped to found the Asian American Hardcore. He himself was once a hardcore drug user Russell was also an ex-con having served serious time in prison, not jail. Russell had a genuineness about him. And as an organizer, he had sincerity and humanity, and it shone through in everything he did. He was also Hapa. He was half Japanese and half Filipino, which made him an effective organizer in both communities. Everyone who was a part of the growing movement at that time was out of the character relative to the mainstream approach to being an Oriental in America. Don't rock the boat could have been the slogan for mainstream Asian America. The movement changed that slogan and it became, became, as we did everything, based on rocking and rolling the boat, rolling the system, changing the system, changing America. Right on. Orna, I love all this history. I mean, you, you mentioned the Japanese village. I remember that because it was in like Buena Park, right? Yeah. Net, not, not too far from Cerritos where I, I grew up. Um, you also mentioned Ghidra. I remember, uh, I wasn't around when Ghidra was being published, but I was working uh, for Pacific Ties, uh, API newspaper at UCLA, and I, anytime I could get a hand of a copy of Ghidra, um, I would always read it intently. Um, but uh, you talk about this kind of organizational history. You talk about uh, the Jack's office. Um, it seems like um, the JACL, the Japanese American Citizens League, was a base of operations for you and connected you to many issues. Now there are two main issues that you, uh, you know, hope you could focus on. Uh, that's the uh, America's concentration camps, the Manzanar pilgrimage, relating to that, and the Vietnam War. Warren. You know, um, Mark and some of you in the audience remember, there was a guy named uh, Jeff Matsui who was the regional director for the Japanese American Citizens League. And the Japanese American and Asian American community didn't quite know what to do with this fledgling 
movement that was happening and was real loud. And Jeff brought the national president, Ray Uno at the time from Utah, to see me. And his explanation was the organization was the second generation Japanese American organization. And their generation was getting old, and if we didn't bring the next generation, the Sansei generation, into the fold, the organization would die. So we asked if I would work for the Japanese American Citizens League. And I got hired, and I started the first community involvement program. But right after I got hired, they hired Victor Shibata and Ron Wakabashi, also as young Sansei staff. They were going to deal with the Japanese American Junior JCL, and I was given this new direction about community involvement. But what it became for all of us, for all three of us, was a base of operations to not only do JCL work, and the junior JCL needed to be re-stimulated and help be brought out of this period of dormancy. And my efforts around the JCL really were an opportunity to just organize for the movement. And there were many issues that we deal with, dealt with. And two of them in particular we did under the guise of the JCL, but really it was for the Asian American movement. And I remember one time Victor and I, Victor Shabbat and I, along with a whole bunch of Asian American activists, we went down to Oceanside to participate in an anti-war rally. And at the demonstration, it was right outside the Marine Corps Recruiting Center and the Marine Corps base in Oceanside. So we knew there was going to be pretty much a confrontation, and there was. The, all the Marines were out on leave in Oceanside. Demonstration took place. It turned out to be a pitch battle. And after we left and the police came and the whole usual thing happened, Victor and I were having lunch, I think, and we were saying, God damn it, we got to march somewhere. You know, the farm workers had just marched from Delano to Sacramento to talk about the plight of the farm workers. The Poor People's March took place in Washington, D.C. Damn it, we as Asian Pacific Islanders kind of marched somewhere. But where? And that's when Victor and I just started thinking, well, what's this camp thing? Now, for Japanese Americans, camps that Japanese were put in during World War II is a touchstone. It's talked about in muted terms, usually quietly. But at every family gathering, it seems to come up, their experiences. Then at a bigger community effort, maybe at the dinner table, someone will reach across with words and say, were your parents in camp? Were you in camp? What camp were you in? What block did you live in? Did you know so-and-so who lived in block such and such? But all was in quiet, muted tones. So we wondered, what is this camp thing and decided maybe that's what we needed to march to, the camps that Japanese were put in during World War II. So we couldn't call it the Manzanar March, because Manzanar we knew and found out was the closest camp to Los Angeles. Manzanar March sounded like a song by John Philip Sousa. <laughs> but then Victor said, it's a pilgrimage. We're going back to somewhere important and special we're going back to find something. So that's when it became the Manzanar pilgrimage. And Victor and I decided, well, let's go see what this Manzanar is like, because we only heard very basic information. It was outside a town called Lone Pine. If you went too far, you hit Independence, and you passed it. You drove by it if you went fishing in the Owens Valley or going skiing up in Mammoth. So there were some landmarks. And so Victor and I decided to drive up there and see for ourselves. <clears throat> so about a mile outside of Lone Pine, Victor and I see this road sign, which we later stole, said Manzanar Road. So going north on 365, we turned right and went east, first on a bit of an asphalt road that turned to dirt. And then there was these crisscrossing dirt roads. And with our limited imagination, we started filling in the banks, planks. This must be where the camp was. But in the distance, there was this pickup truck sort of coming our way with a cloud of smoke behind it. And it kept coming and get closer. And we could see the cowboys in the car with their cowboy hats and their bandanas and the shotguns in the back window on the rifle racks. 
And they pulled up on us and they said, hey boy, what are you doing here? And we were filled with piss and vinegar these days, you all remember. We said, we're not boys. We're here to find the camps that you people like races put us in during World War II. That's what we're doing here. And they started fucking laughing. And that really pissed us off. Now, when I'm with Victor, I know he can handle himself, so I stood a little back from the <laughs> Just in case something kicked off. And they said, are you guys looking for the camps the Japanese were put in during World War II? I said, God damn right we are. <laughs> You're on the wrong side of 395. <laughs> it's on the other side, and they gave us directions. <laughs> So that was the first lesson we learned in humility about the camp experience. If you don't know where you're going, any path will get you there. So you better get good directions on the way. So we found the guard houses and the old auditorium, which was now housing the Inyo County Department of Highways. We'd heard of a cemetery area which was located around the back. We found the dirt road that drove and we drove our way in, and then we saw it. Through the underbrush, and occasionally having to stop to move a tree that had fallen, we went on this dirt road, but it stood out, because everything was organic, and everything was mountains and underbrush, with the Sierra Nevadas in the background. There was this geometric obelisk, a monument, that stood out. It was stark white, with faded black Japanese writing on it. And so Victor and I, we found it. And as we came back and decided we're gonna take our first events on a pilgrimage, we looked around for people that could help us fill in these blanks more about the camps, because nobody wanted to talk about it. When we started talking about the men's on pilgrimage, the older members of JCL and other people in the Japanese American community got angry with us. Why do you want to dig that up? It's in the past. It's better left forgotten. But the more they were upset, the more we kept thinking, there must be something to this. So as we sought out other people, we ran into Sue Embry, who was a teenager in Manzanar. But we met Sue because she was a political progressive. We met her in the anti-war movement. But Sue was the editor of the Free Press, Manzanar Free Press. So she and later she and I started the Manzanar Committee, but she helped us begin to understand. And then Victor's homeboy from the Yellow Brotherhood, one of the founding members, Art Ishii. Art Ishii's mother, and now I understand why Art's got so much swagger. Well, he says he has swagger. <laughs> no, Art has swagger. I found out it comes from his mom. His mom, Amy Uno Ishii, was a no-nonsense Nisei woman, took no bullshit, wasn't afraid to call bullshit on anybody that started talking about how camps were a great thing for Japanese Americans. But father, mother and son weren't the only one with the anti-bullshit gene. Amy had a brother, Edison Uno, in San Francisco, who was the non-traditional Japanese American community leader that was involved in civil rights the anti-war movement and other issues. And we invited him to be the speaker at the first Manson on pilgrimage. But I remember meeting with Edison and we lamented how the Japanese community, they're not gonna talk about this. They don't wanna talk about it. And he said, settle down, young dudes. Listen to what I have to say. He made the analogy that the camp experience was like that of a rape victim. And a rape victim does not want to recount what took place, what happened to them. He said, that's what the Japanese community is like. They were raped. They are not inclined to talk about that incident. So we got our second lesson in humility. But even though we thought that, oh, we wouldn't have gone to camp, when you really hear the stories and peel back the layers, you start seeing what really took place. And we, out of our ignorance, not our stupidity, because we didn't know any better, we took the first vans on our pilgrimage the week after Christmas before New Year's. Nobody goes to the Owens Valley. 
unless you're going skiing in June Mountain to that part of the state. So we went, but they gave us our third lesson in humility about the experience and the issue, because it was so cold, and the wind blew off the Sierra Nevadas, and it was pelting us with sand. And you began to think what it was like to live there for three, four, or five years. And then we came back and we got our fourth lesson in humility. We found out that what we boldly proclaim as the first man's in our pilgrimage really was about the 25th. <laughs> because the lay Christian minister and Buddhist priest, Reverend Wakahiro and Reverend Maeda, had been going back to camp ever since the camp closed. And there was their religious duty because they knew that although the government said that all the bodies were exhumed out of the cemetery, they knew that they were not. And that's why all the men's and our pilgrimages since then focused their activities at the cemetery to pay their respects. So that's what we learned. This issue was something that had an impact on not only the Japanese American community, because what we also found in this very shallow grave that had been revealed to us as the winds blew across the upper desert in the Owens Valley was not only an issue about social justice for the Japanese American community, but for the Asian American community as well. And then, in 1972, the Manson Art Committee and the Japanese American Citizens League applied to the state of California Department of Parks and Recreation for a historical landmark designation for Manzanar. In that effort, those are the plaques that you see when you go on a road trip on a vacation at different historical sites. You're given the limit of 92 words to be cast in bronze to be put at the site. Those 92 words for us establish what we brought to the brought to the party relative to the camp experience, which was a movement perspective. And we fought for two phrases in that 92-word plaque. One was concentration camp. The other was economic greed. Now, even today, the Japanese American community has trouble with calling those camps concentration camps. They prefer internment centers, relocation centers, euphemisms that the governor used because they were more palatable to what they were doing. Others said, you can't use concentration camp because that's what happened with the Jews. But the perspective which we provided was from the outside looking in, not the outside, the inside looking out, not the outside looking in. And that then meant if you were on the inside of the barbed wire, your perspective was different than if you were on the outside of the barbed wire. If you talk to anybody about the camps the Jews were put in during World War II, they don't call them concentration camps. From the inside looking out, they call them death camps. So we fought for the term concentration camp, and we fought for the term economic greed. Because economic greed was a part of the effort of getting the small farmers out of the Central Valley out of the way post-depression. That was the last vintages vestiges of agribusiness completely incorporated and consolidating, consolidating agribusiness into the Central Valley. So with that, for me, I, when I was on the Board of Education, because of my mother-in-law, Aiko Yoshina Herzig, I got the first high school diplomas for the class of 19, what was it, 44, 45, at Los Angeles High School. And then after that, graduation ceremony, we got into several other high schools. Then later when I was in the State Assembly, I got the bill honoring, providing honorary degrees for Japanese Americans whose education was cut short during World War II because of the camp experience that were going to colleges and universities throughout the state of California. And I was also, it was brought to me that I got the Korematsu bill passed. But I made sure that the Korematsu bill wasn't about Fred Kuromatsu's birthday it was about civil liberties in the Constitution. That's what that day is about.
Warren, you just talked about the, the Manzimar uh, pilgrimage and, uh, you know, just pre-pandemic uh, 2019, I, I was just really humbled to, to go to the 50th and uh, thank you for inviting me to that and uh, brought my son. A very powerful experience. Um, and I didn't know that uh, that first one that you took in 69 was actually the 25th, so you, you learn more. You know, um, got to read more about it in this book. Um, but you talk about uh, these organizations at the, the start of the movement, right? And um, you talk about the JCL. I know something had happened, something went down at the Chicago Convention. Can you talk a little bit about that? The Chicago Convention, I went to uh, New York City because we had heard that there was a group in New York called the Asian Americans for Action. They were going to demonstrate at the 1970, 69, 70. Was that the one, Ron? I think it was 69, 70, Chase Hill Convention in Chicago. So Victor and I were sent out to meet with these radicals to find out if they were going to demonstrate and why they were going to demonstrate. And we went out there, and what turned out to be a meeting with where we thought it would be really dealing with people that had contrary views of what we were trying to do, we ended up finding out that really we had so much more in common and started to begin to work together. My best friend, Bob Miyamoto's here. Even though he's from Los Angeles, we met in New York City because he was a part of Asian Americans for Action. And he pretty much kicked our butt in that meeting with Victor and I. We went to a warehouse in the Lower East Side, the first time I have ever been to New York. And we went in a freight elevator, one of those real big elevators that have the wooden gate that you have to lift up and move down and has this handle you have to turn and then it jerks up the building. Victor and I looked at each other and we thought, oh shit, they're gonna assassinate us. <laughs> but after a pretty rough beginning as people tried to figure out what our intentions were, what turned out to be what we thought would be a conflict turned out to really be the first steps in really developing a unity. And we all agreed that we would, at the Chicago Convention, we would have a program about anti-Vietnam War. And we worked together on that. And we also, in Chicago, put together a sort of informal movement conference. Grace Bobs and people came from Detroit. People came from the Pacific Northwest different parts of California and New York, and we had people in Chicago. But all this started to percolate and really started to grow, and then we had a tragedy at the convention where two young women that were part of our entourage got killed. They got their throat slit by a murderer. One of them died and one survived. But it started to work in the JCL where we started going all over the, the country. I went everywhere there was a Japanese American community. I mean, from the East Coast, Midwest, to Pocatello, Idaho. We went wherever there was a Japanese American community. And as we talked about different issues, we talked about the movement. And we started building this national perspective. And then in 72, we were poised, Ron, myself, and others, we were poised to take the organization over. We had talked to some people within the organization, they agreed with us. But when we got to Washington, D.C. for the convention, we were duped, took advantage of, we didn't study enough about Robert's rules, so they got their agenda in front of ours, they took over the organization. We left with our tails between our legs, but we really made a fundamental mistake. We left, told them to go F yourself, and then we went back to the community to organize, which was a good thing. But we had already laid the groundwork for a national organization of progressive, liberal, Asian Americans throughout the United States. That would have been the time for us to coalesce a new organization. But I think one other comment in going back to this camp issue. People need National Coalition of Redress Relations has an excellent book about that iconic struggle for redress and reparations. It's really an important milestone in the Japanese American community. And with it comes all kinds of other things, the Coram Novus case, 
and I have a criticism of my book because I didn't quite get it right, and I still don't know what the right thing is. The decision that was made by the Supreme Court with Trump versus Hawaii around one of the issues related to immigration. Supreme Court Justice Roberts made a comment in talking about that ruling about Korematsu versus the United States. And Sotomayor also chimed in after that and said that it was wrong. The decision by the Supreme Court was wrong. So some people say that the decision was overturned, but I don't think it was. So we have to re-examine that issue because it's still on the books. It's still like a gun, a loaded gun, that can be used whenever there's a group of people that the United States comes out, wants to get out of the way. But let me, thank you. But let me segue, the issue of the camp, the issue of redress reparations, it all relates to perspective, how you look at something. Like the camp issue, that was blossomed. Everybody's got a pilgrimage. Everybody's got a lot of things going about the history of camps. And it's really an important history lesson, a really important touchstone. But it's not nostalgia. The movement put a unique perspective on it. About three years ago, when I went to the pilgrimage, I had this visual of about 50 Muslims, when it became prayer time, putting their prayer rugs on the ground with the monument in the background, praying the Mecca. Because the issue related to camps at that pilgrimage was anti-Muslim sentiment. So we always connected a current political issue with the camp experience, because that was our point of view and that was perspective. And we also did this on this next issue, which we operated with and we dealt with in the JCL at that time, which was the Vietnam War. Warren, um, you talked about the JCL convention in Chicago and then how you ended up leaving there and with a mindset of uh, forming the Asian Americans for confrontation and liberation, kind of a play on the JCL, now AACL. Uh, let's talk about this Asian American thing. You know, the, I think that's finally what we decided to call this effort when we're trying to take over in 1972. Everywhere we went, although we were at the Japanese American Citizens League, we kept running into all these Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who were on the very same path. So we thought that dealing with this Asian American thing, that Asian Americans, and we weren't a Citizens League, we were for confrontation and liberation. So that was what we were talking about. But before I go into this Asian piece, let me just add this one piece about the Vietnam War, and it's related to perspective. In the past, Asians had participated in the broader anti-war movement and mobilizations. When I started looking into it more, I knew that we had people that also served in the armed forces that were Asian American. Nick Nagatani, Mike Nakayama, other veterans became a part of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. And I also met Vince Ogomoto, who was a decorated ranger. And he's got a great book out called Samurai Wolfhound about his experience of being a ranger and being in the Vietnam War, because he became pretty anti-war after his experiences. But in looking at this as Asians participated in the broader Asian American anti-war movement, the first time we had our own rally was in Little Tokyo. And what we did was that providing a perspective on the war that was Asian. And as Asians, we could identify with the suffering of the sisters and brothers in Vietnam. We could identify with the inherent racism in the war that was so evident to those of us that we experienced some of it domestically. But we knew that the racist epithets of gook and sloped would just be added to the already long list of Jap, Chink, Slopi, etc. The declaration of so-called historical yellow peril had now evolved into the red menace. The plight of the Japanese railroad worker captured in the saying a Chinaman's chance transposed itself 
into a new declaration during the Vietnam War, which was to life, to Asians, life is cheap. This accompanied the time-tested slogan, and all you have to do is insert your favorite racist slang. The only good one is a dead one. The movement linked the racist acts of Vietnam War to the nuclear bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, to the same strategy that killed off nations of African Americans. But this policy of expansion with racism as one of its main weapons was built on a foundation called imperialism. This inseparable relationship of oppression of nations with imperialism or expansion is the truth behind the Vietnam War. The war had been going on for years, its different forms ranging from just supplying materials to the French under the Eisenhower administration, to the taking over the war after the Vietnamese defeated the French at Bien Dam Phu under the Kennedy administration, to the Gulf of Conference, to the Gulf, Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which started the bombing in North Vietnam during the Johnson administration to the secret invasion of Cambodia under the Nixon administration, to the absolute defeat of American imperialism and its corrupt puppet government in South Vietnam during the Ford administration. The war had been going on too long. People were tired of the war. But it wasn't that they were tired and it had gone too long. It was just wrong. And then it can stay while demonstrating against the recently imposed secret invasion of Cambodia. Four college students were shot down and killed by the members of the National Guard. Yes, the very essence of the war came home. At this time, I'm going to bring up Joe Verrata. everybody tonight? Yes. I guess it's not night yet, it's afternoon. Y'all still holding up all right? <clears throat> I met Warren for the first time about 40 years ago when I was a, a student at UCLA. He had uh, been organizing an event at Cal State LA and reached out and had a couple of us come out and uh, do a performance out there. And so I don't even remember what song I sang, but I got up there with my guitar, I did my set, and I came off the stage, and the first thing that Warren said to me was, you sound good, but you need a new guitar, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought to myself, who is this guy throwing shit at me for my guitar? <laughs> and I thought, then I thought, all right, I, I, can, I can deal with this guy. I know this guy. He's, he was somebody who sounded like, acted like, felt like somebody from the neighborhood. And I felt like, OK, we can, we can work here. We can do something together. Um, one of the things that Warren was always good at and continues to be good at is not only opening the door and reaching out to these young bloods, but bringing them in, bringing them into the door, bringing them into the community, making sure that they feel a part of and recognize that they are connected to one another and to our historical experience. I think that through the work that Warren has done, um, he has made sure that the story stories don't just get passed along within a single generation, but that they are passed on to the next generation, to the next generation, to the next generation. And he brings us all forward. He introduced me to the idea of an Asian American. Up until that point, I knew I was Filipino. I said, yeah, I'm Filipino. But Warren introduced me to the idea that my experience and those of those farm workers from the Central Valley were connected to his experience as a Japanese American from the South Bay. And they were connected to the experiences of a restaurant worker in Chinatown or to a nurse uh, working in hospitals. He, rec he helped to, me to recognize that all of our experiences are connected to one another. And he introduced me to this particular song that I want to share with you all today. Mr. 
Mr. Wu who works in the laundry and his wife sews in the shop. Each and every wrinkle tells a tale. A survivor of the hard times and a fighter all his life. The twinkle in his eyes has never failed. He puts his iron on the table and he leans against the wall. He says, excuse my English, but his words speak for us all. He says, these hands have washed the clothes. These hands have served the food, heaven knows. This neck has felt the mob's rope and it's been behind barbed wire. His arms have laid down railroad tracks. His back has been for hire. His hands have fought injustice and his soul has been on fire. <clears throat> but I'm still here. I'm going strong. I'm getting tired of proving I belong. There's Mrs. Gomez, she works the night shift at the pediatrics ward. By day she fixes meals for her own. New in a big city, but she's never giving up. And does her best to give her kids a home. There's Mrs. Kim who sells produce in the corner of the square. People pass by quickly, but we all know she's there. And so the story goes on to another generation. Page another chapter being turned. Tomorrow is the struggle we face in anticipation. And yesterday, the lessons we have learned. Johnny, he's a young boy, he pumps gas to pay for school. Classes being cut back one by one. Well, John's father marched in Europe while his mother was in camp. And each shows off the battle scars they've won. Sometimes you hear his voices come drifting through the wall. But each knows deep inside them that what binds them binds us all. Because our hands have washed the clothes. Our hands have served the food, heaven knows. Our necks have felt the mob rope, they've been behind barbed wire. Our arms have laid down railroad tracks, our back has been for hire. Our hands have fought injustice and our souls are still on fire. But we're still here, we're going strong. We're getting tired of proving we belong. We're still here, we're going strong. We're getting tired of proving we belong. Yeah, we're here. We're going strong. We're getting tired of proving we belong. Yeah, we're still here. We're going strong. We're getting tired of proving we belong. Let's give it up for Joe. Warren, this next question is about um, didn't the Vincent Chin case and others like it galvanize the Asian American movement? But I just have to say, before we get into that, with you know, especially as we come out of this pandemic and we saw the rise in anti-Asian violence, uh, we know, those in the movement know, that this isn't anything new, that it just, we constantly are scapegoated. Um, so if you could throw it back to the beginning of the movement and what 
that Vincent Chin case um, helped in the building of the Asian American movement. Just looking at who's here and all the friends here, people remember the Vincent Chin case. People remember the Chosu Lee case. People remember, as I talked about the Manzoar pilgrimage issues, that they may have related to a specific Asian ethnic group, really galvanized an Asian Pacific Islander movement. Maybe on the most negative side of the ledgers, because we know that people can't tell the difference anyway. But on the other side of the ledger, you begin to know that this Asian American is a real thing. It's not just something we made up. But I couldn't get into wearing a yellow beret. Even though most everything related to progressive politics in the late 60s and early 70s was referenced by color, I couldn't fathom wearing a yellow beret. I know the Panthers wore a black beret, the Latinos wore and call themselves the Brown Berets, the American Indian Movement AIM wore a red beret, duh. The Young Lords wore purple berets. Well, they were Puerto Rican, so you knew they'd be colorful. But I wasn't going to wear a yellow beret. At the times, the terms black power, the term brown power, they were watchwords for the movement of the day. A young student activist, Amy Yuamatsu, wrote an essay entitled Yellow, Yellow Power, but did that apply to us? Back in the day when I first heard Slokley speak, he said black people needed to define themselves for themselves and by themselves. Well, as Asian Americans, if we were tired of being called Orientals or Mongolians, we felt, and I felt, we needed to do the same thing. But what was an Asian American? It is a person of Asian descent that came to the United States and is a part of American history and a part of the American experience. From that point of view, the identity question was more than just being Japanese American for me. As a, maybe because I was fourth generation, I began to see that within the Asian American community, not only were Japanese Americans marrying other people of other races, but there were marrying other Asian Americans. So my new grandson, who was six months old, when Tyler Tadashi Furutani looks in the mirror, he's not gonna say I'm Japanese, he's not gonna say I'm Chinese, he's not gonna say I'm ethnic Chinese with a family that came from Vietnam. He's a new Asian American. But the immigration cycle repeated itself over and over in American history. And it brought in cheap labor that eventually became used as scapegoats when the economy turned down. So that meant that there was a Chinese exclusion act, the Japanese Gentlemen's Agreement. Then later, the Tidings McDuffie Act, which related to the end of the Spanish-American War, but limited immigration from the Philippines. But I contend that culturally, that all this taking place in a vacuum, basically of no immigration or measure from 1935 to 1965. That even though you might have eaten chow mein if you were Chinese, yakisoba if you were Japanese, chapche if you were Korean, or Filipino pancet, the four major groups at the time, even though there were different condiments and different ingredients to a certain degree, were all noodles. We're all noodles. <laughs> so if you grew up during that time, 1930s to the mid-1965, you grew up in this vacuum, and whether you were a chink, a jap, a garlic eater, or a flip, especially since the broader public couldn't tell that we diff looked differently anyway, our history in America was the same. We were exploited workers being segregated by external and internal forces into ethnic communities, but those communities also provided protection and cultural preservation. Plus, no one could become a naturalized citizen until the 1950s. We, the movement, were defining ourselves by ourselves, for ourselves, and it was empowering. The term Asian American is dynamic and ever-evolving. And with the growth through the opening of immigration after the 1965 Immigration Act, 
and the end of the Indochina War in 1972, three, the numbers in the community have exploded to the point the Asian American Pacific Hawaiian and Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders are now, along with our Latino sisters and brothers, the fastest growing populations in the United States. That's what Asian Pacific Islanders are. Warren, you talk about how the community over the years has been dynamic and changing in terms of uh, before Oriental to Asian American, to Asian American and Pacific Islander. Um, as a Philam, I know that we're an, an integral part of the AAPI community, um, and uh, you know, talk a little bit about your uh, involvement with some of the other groups from Island Nations. It was my dad. He had a heart attack in his mid forties. He had to come to Jesus moment. He was a worker and had his own small business, but he grew up in the fledgling fiberglass industry. So when he had his heart attack because he was a fat soul and he smoked palm malls and all the other things that you might see in Alan and myself, uh, he had this heart attack and after his heart attack, he had a whole change in life. Uh, he started working with, and you talk to a lot of my closest friends, everybody knows Chuck, as I said, my dad was a cool dad. My mom was a rock and Walter. But my dad was a cool dad. I remember coming home from seventh grade after a health class, and we were told about marijuana. And I came home and I saw my dad sitting in front of the television. He always had this big film can about his spit. <laughs> he had a playing card, and he had this oregano-looking stuff in his can. <laughs> and he kept taking it. <laughs> and these seeds would fall out. The, I didn't know what he was doing until I took that health class and then realized all those years my dad had been smoking marijuana. But in that effort of, of uh, working with youth, he came in touch with Samoan gang members. He started by working in West Long Beach with Chicano gang members, and they introduced him to Samoan gang members. So he started working with Samoan youth. Then in the Samoan community in Carson, he along with other organizers like Simi Potasi and Tupi Sua and K1 Young and many others started the Omai Fatase Team Post. But that introduced me to the Pacific Islander community. And I respect the fact that Pacific Islanders have their own lane. We connect them with Asian Americans, but sometimes it's not a natural fit. I mean, at the most basic level, they don't eat rice as their main staple. So when talking about the Pacific Islander community, you have to acknowledge their uniqueness and why disaggregation of data is really critical because you don't want the Asian American stereotype to be applied to the Pacific Islander community because there's different needs, different issues. But we also have common ground, and maybe that's Hawaii. But my dad really took to working with the small community and they with him, and he introduced them to me. But I remember one story. My dad and a group of Samoans, they had the name the Fat Boys. I don't know why they were called that, <laughs> other than they were all fat. <laughs> but they used to visit the local Chinese buffets in the area. They would rotate so they didn't put people out of business. But one day on the way home, they stopped is we were driving through San Pedro because a police officer stopped him. So my dad jumped out of the car, okay, he got out as fast as he could. And he started cussing the police officer out. The Samoan brothers, they were not unfamiliar with being harassed by the police. And so they were all concerned about whether they're gonna get shot, taken to jail, or whether my dad was having a chum in sort of flashback. <laughs> But he started cussing, and then they got all upset, my dad's friends. And then my dad started laughing because the police officer was an old San Pedro friend, Charlie Blanick, who had stopped him just to say hello. <laughs> so basically, he pumped the Samoans on that day. <laughs> but Pacific Islanders are a part of it. But one thing 
and I don't know if I'd say this too publicly, but one thing I appreciate about the Asian hate that's going on right now is that it's jolted a lot of Asian Pacific Americans into the reality that you're not a, a Jason white person. You're different. And the way I came up, and it was a part of not only being Japanese American to be Asian American to be Asian Pacific Islander, I came up working with Gil Cedillo and Antonio Villaraigosa and George Pla and Latino power shift that's taking place. I mean, for me, California is not a case of it's brown, it's red, or it's blue. To me, California, it's brown. It's brown. So I learned from African-American activists in the civil rights movement, from the black power movement. I learned from the Latino power shift, particularly in the area of electoral politics. They've taken me under their wing. They've made me a part of their family. So third world is the context, even back in the day, at the CRP, at San Francisco State, at Cal Berkeley, everybody flew the flag of the Third World United Front or the Third World Liberation Front. And third world to us meant people of color, women, the disenfranchised, who needed to come together, not just work in their own lane, not just be concerned about their own community, but to be concerned about all, because social justice is what this is all about. So let me thank Mark for helping out today. I just wanted to go through a couple of few things before I finish. And I've only talked about half of the book. As most of you know, I'm much more comfortable speaking or orating rather than reading. But in the second half of the book, I talked about being elected official to trials and tribulations. I also talk about how the new left went so far left, we came around on the right. And I see a lot of that today. But what I also have come to believe is there's two important slogans to understand, two concepts. One, it's called the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg. Right now, we seem to be involved with the tip of the iceberg. Everybody's upset about what that little tip is above the level of the ocean, when 90% of the problem is below the water. So you can talk about the homeless, and it's important to get them housed. But are we going to house them tomorrow, the next month, the next year, the next 10 years? Are we going to be the ones to have this welfare kind of state? Or do we promote self-determination? Do we promote people standing on their own two feet? And when you start talking about that, you start talking about education. You talk, start talking about where the real solutions lie. So with even Black Lives Matter, if you look at all the ones that have been in the headlines, all of them were initially arrested for, for some small, the most recent one was for a broken taillight. Others were arrested because they sold loose cigarettes outside of a liquor store. Another one, Mike Brown in, in Missouri, was arrested because he supposedly stole some cigarettes. Another one was because he had a counterfeit $20 bill. All of them small, criminal acts that they needed to do to survive. But every one of them came from a low level socioeconomic community with really not many benefits or hopes or dreams. Without an education, without doing the kind of work you need to do to build the community, folks are gonna to continue to be having problems, not only with the police, but every part of society. So the other term for me is you can teach a person how to fish and they can eat their whole life, or you can give them a fish, and they eat that day. I think too much of what we're doing is we're just trying to give people a fish. How about teaching them how to fish? So, <laughs> let me end with this. The Black Panther Party have, used to have a famous, infamous 10-point program. And I give you these 10 thoughts just to think about. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the three branches of government, the checks and balance system, the government divided into federal, state, and local entities, it still works. In other words, it ain't broke, but needs occasional navigational adjustments along the way. 
a hybrid class, a hybrid capitalist socialist economic system where creativity, entrepreneurship, and initiative are rewarded and where all who work share in those rewards. In other words, we need to raise all goals. A society where people will be respected and rewarded for their work and the means of production and business will be regulated and limited so greed doesn't sabotage the, elect the collective being of the whole. In other words, put people over profit. An equitable society in which all who have and share, all will have the spare time and sense of purpose that they can pursue their passion and interests. In other words, to do that, a society where everybody does and pays their fair share. Where everyone will be judged by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin, their economic station in life, their gender, religion, or from whence they came. In other words, what Dr. King said. A society where you treat everyone as you'd want to be treated. In other words, the universal principle of reciprocity. Where actions speak louder than words and where you walk your talk. In other words, practice what you preach. Where your two ears and one mouth indicate how you interact with each other. In other words, listen more than you speak. Where the elderly are respected and cared for and the young cherished and protected. In other words, it takes a village. And where the planet as a whole is replenished, rejuvenated, revered and respected for the life source it is. In other words, power to the people, a luta continua. Thank you. Before, before, one thing I want to say as we end the program with a video, short video. As we all know that you don't do this by yourself. In the forward I write in the book, this book doesn't represent all the people I've worked with or all the issues we've addressed. But the thing I most respect about what I've done myself and what I respect about most all of you in this audience is we've been doing this for a long fucking time. <laughs> we have been committed, we have sustained our work, and we continue on and ain't done yet. But there's one thing we all know, we don't do this by ourselves. And I'd like to dedicate this performance today and this reading to my partner in life, someone I couldn't do this without. And that's my wife, the person I love, Lisa Furutano. <laughs>